Right, so uh, we welcome back everyone. Um, we're now starting the second, this is theme four, which is new fundings and incentive mechanisms for uh, new cooperativism. So I'm going to hand over to our facilitator, Elizabeth Mansari, just after I remind you that you can turn off your audio and your video if you don't want to be recorded during the, the, the sessions in this room. In the breakout rooms, you will not be recorded. OK, so over to you, Elizabeth. Okay, thank you, Rory. Can you all hear me well? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Elizabeth Mazzari, and as uh, Rory said, together we'll be facilitating this interesting discussion, which I think has many interesting also overlaps with the previous uh, part of, uh, of the seminar. Uh, so it is a great pleasure to introduce our two plenary speakers, Stephen Hill and Dave Boyle. So Stephen has been working with COPS for over 20 years, uh, starting out at the Scott Mead Cooperative in 1995 and has an IT background. And uh, Stephen is the CEO and CTO of uh, VME, a technology company uh, he, he has been running for, again, yeah, over 20 years successfully, and uh, which has more recently converted to a cooperative, a VME Coop, with offices in the UK and Malta. Uh, and VME Coop is one of the leading uh, software providers for retail uh, Coops in the UK. And he's also a CEO and CTO of Coop Exchange, which is a mobile application uh, that allows anyone in the world to invest in, in Coops. And uh, then we have Dave with us, who was a CEO in the community ownership uh, sector and is now director at uh, the Community Shares Company, which uh, specializes in helping organizations raise capital from their supporters. And also Dave has uh, many years of experience of working with community and uh, social businesses advising them on community share issues in sports such as football clubs, leisure, pubs, energy, media, uh, and so on. And he's also a partner at Principle 6 uh, that helps community-owned businesses to start up preparations uh, and convert to traditional businesses. And also to mention, uh, reading his uh, profile, that uh, he has worked on uh, some high uh, profile share issues, including Hastings Peer Charity, which was the first charity to raise equity finance in the UK, and Port Patrick Harbour, uh, the first Scottish charity to do so. So without further ado, um, our two speakers will have five minutes each to make a statement, and um, then uh, we can follow uh, up uh, the discussion around the theme of alternative uh, ways of fi uh, financing, and crowdfunding and so on. So I think Stephen, you can yeah, start first. Please. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, it, it has been 25 years. Um, I don't feel that old, but it has been 25 years working in or for the cooperative movement. But uh, just a bit of background to there, VME works with um, a lot of the consumer co-ops in the UK. I think nine of the 13 independents. So there's a, a steeped in cooperation. But ironically, you know, even though working with co-ops um, for many, many years, it was only in 2017 that I discovered that there was uh, uh, there are other types of co-ops as opposed to just consumer co-ops. I'd assumed all co-ops were just food stores. They're all the way from 1995 right through to 2017. Uh, and, I, and I kind of feel that some, sometimes summarizes the problem and um, part of it being principle five education. But, uh, you know, the, I, I'd been involved in the movement. And I still didn't understand. So what hoped a lot of the general public had. So I, I think a big part of what we're generally doing is trying to, to fix that. Um, but back to, to topic. So very, very briefly, I'll try not to be even five minutes. Um, the, when we were converting VME, the major issue with capital, um, VME was a, had a value. It, it was owned by a number of people, not all of who believed, uh, of whom believed in cooperation. Uh, they wanted an exit um, and they wanted value for their investment. 
Um, and, and really, I wanted to, to see cooperation as that exit. And, and there was no, uh, I didn't know Dave. <laughs> so we hadn't looked at community shares or anything at that point in time, but we couldn't see a, an, easy, an easy route, an easy option. So um, I was thinking, how, you know, what are the routes and ways we could address this? So I did come across Rory and Fair Shares, uh, multi-stakeholder concepts with the concept of an investor class, you know, actually allowing people to contribute funding um to try and make something happen and in return giving some return you know potentially a portion of surplus or something um and that just seemed to me to be very fair my favorite word in the whole world is fair hence why i like fair shares and, and i think you need to be fair to, to investors and supporters as well as um what i call the the active members uh, of an organization and, and entrepreneurs so so i wanted to highlight a key point actually that rory made uh, in a presentation last year and this this is where this summarizes one of the inspirations um, and his point that he made is that the, the logic of, of old cooperativism let's call it um, goes something like this yes you can work here as long as you accept that consumers come first and Rory describes that as, as tacit philanthropists the workers in this case or it could be equally you know the opposite in terms of worker cooperation um, you must accept that the profits go to the producers. Um, but the key point is the last point, which is, yes, you can invest in us so long as you do not expect a return anytime soon, if ever. <laughs> so, you know, you're expecting, um, it's almost that the, the capital seen as a quasi donation rather than investment choice. Uh, and I think one of the key things for me is growing the cooperative economy. And to do so, I think we need to recognize that we, we want to get the general public, the people that don't really know too much about co-ops um, involved. Um, and the whole dynamics of finance is, is shifting now with a lot of younger investors looking for more ethical investments. So uh, I'll be running out of time quickly here. So I'm going to jump to the, the controversial topics here to, to facilitate public investment. Um, and I, I like the idea of the Facebooks, the Googles, you know, the big uh, organizations like that becoming cooperatives, becoming ethical business, and even smaller levels than that. So, so I'm talking about um, a different structure to, to what Dave works with. Um, so I don't see any kind of uh, competition here in what we're describing. Um, but in order to enable uh, public investment, uh, there is legislation that exists. Um, and it's, it's a word that some cooperators consider evil, which is PLC. Uh, the UK is PLC, so it's public limited company. Um, and what I'm talking about is creating a cooperative PLC. So effectively um, entrenched articles that ensure one member, one vote, ensure that it adheres to the cooperative identity, ensure that it, it, it respects the cooperative values and principles. Um, and that allows general investment, but it does raise the debate of transferable shares versus withdrawable shares, uh, which is one for discussion today. Um, and it does raise a debate around capital growth as well, which is a really interesting topic because capital growth, if you look at the, the statistics since the 60s, I believe, um, especially in the late 70s, certainly, um, compared to wages, the graphs like this, the wage is almost level. So, uh, you know, people need money to work for them. Uh, otherwise, it's effectively devaluing with inflation. So I think we need a, a good debate within the movement around the concept of capital growth within cooperatives. And just to finish off, um, I do believe that, that non-voting is important for, for investor shares. Um, if I buy a share in Facebook or any other organization there, I might have technically a vote, but it's a meaningless vote. I have no control whatsoever. It's only the big players that actually have any say. So if we look at, at empowering the general community, lots of little investors together, um, I don't see non-voting investor shares as being a, a um, barrier to entry there. I actually think that could facilitate um, a lot of good things, uh, least of which uh, includes principle five, educating people about what co-ops are. So I'll stop at that point and we'll come back later. Thank you, Stephen. Dave? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll try and keep the time as well. Um, so first thing to say, community shares is, uh, I don't know how much people on this call and people who might be watching this will be aware of that. So I'll try and give a really brief potted history. Um, and then come up with five provocations at the end, which will hopefully stimulate some debate. Um, so community shares is essentially a rebrand of withdrawable share capital um, in cooperative and community benefit societies in the UK. And 
it's essentially a very nice and easy to understand way of describing the often very difficult concept to express of withdrawable share capital. We can talk about what withdrawable share capital is. I'm going to assume for the basis of this that this is a fairly expert audience and this familiarity with these kind of concepts, but do come back to me if that's an incorrect assumption on my part. Um, I should pay tribute at this point to the work of the Community Shares Unit based in uh, Cooperatives UK's offices in Manchester and particularly the work of Jim Brown from Baker Brown Associates and Hugh Rollo from Locality, who really did the kind of dragging, kicking and screaming governments and other, uh, well, mainly different parts of the UK government, mainly the deal which deal with English matters, um, into recognising there was an agenda here which could be supported, which was about empowering communities to become investors and owners of the assets and services which mattered to them, and managing to do so without it getting wrapped up in that, frankly, from, you know, from a editorialised awful privatization agenda which was hey let's mutualize things which are currently run by the state it was no let's mutualize the things which are currently in the private sector which have a public quality to them um which which are which private ownership doesn't really capture um and isn't necessarily the best place to operate it um the data sets available to describe the scope and scale of the community shares market are quite um gappy um sketchy um, and we've relied upon several surveys which have been very much at a moment in time and amongst the many 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 um, problems of the pandemic was the fact that there was a survey which was all being geared up to go out to loads of investors in community shares which had to kind of get put on the back burner and then didn't get quite the tub thumping publicity drive however that survey based on 500 responses the, the, the hardest data which we have, which Co-ops UK managed, says there's been about £155 million raised from about 200 share offers from about 105,000 people. Um, over what time period, I hear you ask? Let's say roughly the last decade, but it bleeds at the earlier parts because there is an issue of, you know, when was the first community share issue? And technically, if we're being accurate, it was 1844. So... Um, you know, there's, there's, you, you can slice and dice this data, but that's roughly where we are at the moment. Um, and like so much of these things, it's not really that new. Not only is the form of withdrawable share capital itself not new at all, the idea of people raising money collectively, raising a small amount from lots of people to take place, to take the place of investor support from a large amount from small number of people is as old as the hills and crowdfunding is itself just a technological wrapper around what charities have been doing since the year dot as any visit to any town in in certainly in the UK which will have a public subscription uh, war memorial will demonstrate um, but it is it is harnessing the power of crowdfunding technologies to actually make it easier to uh, undertake those investments um, one of the things which sits behind all of this is the UK regulatory framework which essentially if you wish to raise public subscription capital um, it's very heavily regulated but if, if you're undertaking uh, an offer of transferable securities, because withdrawable share capital is not transferable, it escapes that whole regulatory regime. And therefore, it's been a very attractive and, and comparatively cheap way for communities to get up and running and make those offers to their communities to get subscription money without running the risk of breaking the law. Um, flipping into the provocations uh, one of the first ones i'd say is that actually leads into the um one of the issues which is how much do the people who are cooperating through these structures actually know about cooperation when they're basically using this structure because it's the cheapest one and it is the case of any port in a storm and whilst that could see it's a gateway drug to cooperation it could also be a bit like, um, you know, there's a huge room which they don't realise they're in because the lights just shines on their part of it. And so, you know, there is an element of how much of the people who are using these structures actually really bought into the values and principles which underpin the legal structures and the capital structures which have led to this point. Um, big issue is that of diversity. Um, the survey of investors demonstrated that astonishingly people with money to invest in things tended to be wealthier 
who knew? It's like their baby boomers basically did something and then pulled up the drawbridge or something. So the boomer generation is essentially the main driving investor community. And the boomer generation, not just, uh, it's a verified subset of that generation. It's, uh, it's something like two thirds of community share investors are over 60 and have higher degrees. This was from a time when the UK population going to university or higher education was about 4%. So you've got a massive over-representation of essentially the educated middle class with values. And that th there's a wider issue of how do we make sure that this form of capital raising is appropriate for communities outside those age cohorts and outside those demographic cohorts of basically people who benefited from the uh, working class the, the the welfare state final provocation I have to wind you up I have to wind yeah you yeah up sorry the final the final provocation really is about linking to that of is community shares essentially a form of cooperative capital which is um time limited Essentially, when the boomers have all died out and it's Thatcher's children who step up to the plate of being the ones in their mid 50s with some degree of wealth, will we get the same read across and will the subscriptions continue to go in? And the final one, the, the, the one final thing I'd say as well is about governance, about there's a massive challenge for how do you govern these organisations with 500 members um, and in, in an era of modern technology where where essentially everybody knows that probably one of the worst ways to get involvement is to say to those 500 people, would we like to get 20 of you to come to a room and basically act as a representative sample? Well, yeah. So I think you opened up many questions uh, that uh, we can explore in the next 10, 15 minutes and you can, you know, elaborate a bit more. So we talked, I guess, about, um, the the challenge of raising capital for cooperatives and um because of the principles of cooperatives and the structure of cooperatives they might not always feel comfortable with capital and its power and um, then on the other hand we have alternative forms of raising capital that you are familiar with and you nicely um, mentioned how the cooperative movement can be considered kind of a precursor or to uh, forms like crowdfunding and this kind of movements are linked in principle. So I will just raise a, a general question and then you can you know, add your own uh, observations and comments based on all the interesting issues that have been uh, raised. So do uh, cooperatives take advantage? So we have on the one hand, the need for um, wider you know, users to invest in cooperatives, and then we have cooperatives themselves. Do they take advantage of this uh, synergy uh, in the principle of crowdfunding or similar uh, means of raising capital? And how do they respond based on your experience and talking to cooperatives to the rise of um, platforms or um, means such as crowdfunding, lending and investing? Um, I, I can, I, I'm happy to go first if that's right with you, Stephen. Yeah, okay. Cool. Um, so my first thought is that it's the majority of organisations who've undertaken community share issues have used this form of the Community Benefit Society. Um, there are historical and cultural reasons why that has been the case, but a big factor as well as those kind of contingent institutional factors is also there is something about it fits. If a community are looking to buy their local pub, the idea that it should be run as a cooperative with them sharing in the profits. Every time I've raised it with groups looking to do this, there is a, almost a distaste for the notion that anybody should profit from this enterprise. It's not that they don't like the idea of paying dividends and they want to do philanthropy. They just don't think anybody should be profiting from an activity which is inherently social and provided on the basis of social um, outcomes rather than business endeavor. And so there is a, um, so, that, so whilst these community benefit societies aren't consumer cooperatives, they are controlled by their members who are overwhelmingly, if you did a Venn diagram, the intersection would be very large between their members and their core consumers. Um, just realise you can't really do uh, things on Zoom like that. But anyway, I think you get the idea. Um, so 
it's it, a lot of cooperative a lot of people are eschewing cooperative forms for these types of institutional share offers to control assets which matter to their communities because it just doesn't seem to fit with the vibe however on the other side of that there are quite a few worker cooperatives who have now recognized that this is a valid means to raise capital in addition to the loan stock which has pretty much been the only tool in their armory when it came to raising capital and not not diluting the worker control of an enterprise so i've I, in the last year i've worked on three cooperative share offers which have raised um around three hundred thousand pounds a piece um, and those people are classed as non-user investor members and they have 10% of the voting equity of the cooperative. The workers control 90% of the voting equity. And um, alluding to the point Stephen was raising about kind of non, it's because you can't not have members of a society under society law in the UK where they don't have a voice. However, you can dilute that voice to almost insignificant levels. And that's not proven a barrier because the vast majority of the investors are people who would have happily bought loan stock but are happy to support the raising of the capital through withdrawable shares and the fact that they don't have a huge degree of influence over the cooperative doesn't really matter because they're buying into the ethos of it being a cooperative and therefore as not actual members of the cooperative why should they be involved in it so the people who are subscribing to these share offers in co-ops are definitely very much on board with the cooperative ethos to the extent that they are happy to take a back seat in governance terms. Thank you, Stephen. And just shortly, just a short, because I don't have an awful lot to add to that. Um, I mean, that was, that was super, but Dave there in summary, I think the angle that I'm coming at is slightly different and that we're talking about trying to generate new sur surplus generating uh, co-ops um, to create new ones instead of choosing the, the uh, private limited company route, uh, but also to convert existing, you know, mom and pop type businesses that we talked about in the, the previous seminar is a route to try and allow, in my example, the mom and pops to be able to exit and the value that they've built up in that business, but actually convert it to co-op ownership. But the one bit I would add to this, and it is a different angle from Dave, but uh, the, there is, there's a bank in the UK, an online bank, uh, Monzo, that did a share offer to the public. Um, and I think, don't quote me exactly, but the raise figures aren't too far away. I think they raised 17 million in 14 minutes or some short, ridiculously short period of time. Um, and people bought into it. You know, the general public bought into this because they felt they're buying a piece of Monzo. Now, actually, if you look at it, they bought less than 2%. You know, they have absolutely no real, real say or control. Um, and there's similar examples in Brewdog and, and many others um so the cooperative movement to be able to take advantage of technology to actually help grow the cooperative economy so i think that's all i'd add on that, that particular angle yeah thank you dave do you want to add anything no um so we have another question as part of um the seminar and um, this relates to um kind of um having this potential global membership so investment platforms that open up to a potential for a global membership and is this going to undermine community funding mechanisms in your view i went first last time so i think stephen should go first this time <laughs> sure 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 uh, again i'll be I'll try and be even quicker this time um i for, my opinion on this is that if there are individuals across the world that want to support community um, efforts in other parts of the world, we should let them. Um, and I'll use an example very briefly. I was at a conference in New York a couple of years back and I was on a conference call and I was talking about these concepts and I kept quiet as I could. I was in the breakfast area and I was quiet as I could on the call. Um, and when I hung up the call, I turned to uh, an, an older couple next to me and I said, look, I'm sorry if I interrupted your breakfast. I tried to keep as quiet as possible. And they said, no, tell us all about it. Sounds amazing. Sounds fantastic. And I explained it briefly to them about the idea of supporting you know, things across the world. And they said, that's great. They said, we'd invest. I said, and all of our hippie friends in Maryland, they'd invest as well. So I thought that was just a great example of you know, across the world that there may be, you know, a, a venture in Australia, for example, that uh, that aligns with our own personal values that we want to support. 
um, and yet I'm not in Australia. So for me, community is, is more than just local. Um, I'll stop at that point. Um, I mean, I, it's already happening, partly because the UK is um, prides itself on being open for business. Um, anybody from around the world can invest in a UK-based uh, cooperative or community benefit society in ways which are more difficult in other jurisdictions. So, for example, crowdfunding in Australia is heavily restricted um, in terms of the if you're getting investors from more than one state, it, it has to go through a regulated process. And it's very difficult to utilize. The whole point of a crowdfunding platform is to extend the reach of your investment offer beyond the narrow confines of the, of the territorial province you happen to be based in. So a uh, good one there, guys, well thought through. But beyond that, the, um, so for example, New Internationalist, I worked on, that's a, a, a long-standing uh, worker cooperative magazine, which realized that it, it needed to get some new capital in. They did a share issue. They've, they've done two share offers now, one for 700,000 in 2017, another one just now for 300,000 to sort of reinflate their cash flow as a result of the pandemic. They've got shareholders in 30 countries around the world um, in pretty much every time zone. Um, apart from a couple of the mid-Pacific ones, um, because they just didn't manage to get any investors from Tahiti mainly, um, and they could have had, but they could have had 24-hour coverage. That's fantastic, but it does create a problem using a UK governance form, which is fundamentally unchanged since 1890, and therefore privileges in presence contribution to governance which for an organization built around notions of global justice to then have its AGM in a room in Oxford for some white people to come to just kind of it's it, the dissonance is stunning so they've been working on trying to develop mechanisms to include their members outside of the formal governance roles and they've developed a Commonwealth Council, they've called it, no, they're Common Council, because Commonwealth was obviously um, had uh, imperialist overtones. So they, they, they call it the Common Council and they are bringing in people outside of the formal governance structures on an asynchronous basis, where in different time zones, but still it's a bit shonky. What we need is a kind of platform to organize all of this. The nearest I've seen is, um, I forget the name of it, it's that photo co-op based in Canada. Um, that's it. I, I saw Stop you mouthing. Soon. That's the one. Their platform is fantastic. I think partly because it's been developed by people who have an eye for the visual and therefore it looks beautiful, which I think is an absolute sin qua non for this kind of thing um, in, in order to make it work as opposed to some slightly shonky Linux based thing, which looks terrible and works kind of. It's like it needs to be the sort of thing my mum could use, which is to say have the user experience and user interface of a Facebook, but with the budget of a not Facebook. And that's the kind of circle which we need to square in in terms of making this kind of thing work. Hey, I think that uh, gave uh, enough food for thought. And I think it's about time to move to our breakout groups. Um, so Rory, if you could allocate yeah, the participants in different groups where you can discuss the provocations raised here or any other issues and then we can. Okay, so um, Sylvia, do you want to join a breakout group this time? Um, you're a, you're a, um, not a facilitator this time around. So uh, I'll, there's, we've got 18, so I'll create three rooms again. Uh, if, if one room is uh, left empty, I'll move the people or there's only a couple, I'll move them into the other rooms. So uh, let me recreate. Right, so thanks for that. I, um, I confess, because I was monitoring the chat, I, I didn't follow the conversation as well as I'd hoped, but I will when I redo that. So what, just, just curious, what, um, what do you make of each other's contributions? I wish I'd met Dave. A few years ago, <laughs> I'm sure we could have some great conversations. I'm sure. Yeah, I've, I've, um, I'm intrigued. I'm increasingly. There is a space which involves using transferable shares and more traditional corporate forms to achieve cooperatively aligned structural outcomes. Uh, the big the, there's some really fascinating stuff going on in the US at the moment for the tech startup cooperative platform thingies. I've been doing a bit of work with uh, with start.coop 
um, yeah. over there. And they, they're, they're hamstrung in one respect because the, the investment climate is so restricted by the SEC regulations, which make it very difficult to raise capital from ordinary people. So they've had to go to a kind of the philanthropic stroke, slightly more ethical wing of the 1%. Um, and and try and get some money from them and get from people who align with the cooperativeness of the ventures they're funding. But they're doing the stuff they're doing on kind of egg, um, what's it revenue based funding and revenue based uh, dividends because you've got flexibility with when you know essentially what is an investment? It's a piece of paper for which, which is transacted for a certain amount of cash, and that piece of paper gives rights to the investors and the legal and i and i as much as the legal framework in the uk has been brilliant for creating community shares withdrawable shares is ultimately a straitjacket it's really really great at some really really basic things the moment you want to be not basic mm. it gets really really hard to make it work and you can hack it and i've been i do lots of hacking of the withdrawable share structure but you reach the limit of how much you can hack before you have to reprogram and start again from scratch. Dave, just for background, I, I didn't want to bore everyone with some kind of pitch around this, um, but just for background, the, the, the strategy I'm working with, Ben Reid, um, ICA board member, and Pauline Green, yeah. ICA president, um, on the project. Um, and the, the idea is actually literally, just what you described, it's actually hitting it head on. It's raising a substantial amount of capital, ironically, <laughs> um, to engage with the FCA, in our case at the moment, uh, here in Malta with the MFSA, uh, in the US with the SEC, um, through NCBA CLUSA, we've had some connections. Um, yeah. It's early days, but what we're talking about is, for, for me personally, this is a 20 plus year project. You know, it's, it's a big ambition. Um, and as you mentioned there, it's a particular niche that, that I think is worth um, attempting to, uh, to solve in some shape or form. Um, but it needs to be done properly. And that means being um, regulated appropriately. It also means things like, uh, you mentioned this earlier, um, the cost uh, when you need to look at transferable shares versus withdrawable and so forth. It's about trying to drive down the cost yeah. of that. Um, yeah. We have some finance people, some lawyers on the team as well. Um, and trying to, I, I call it, and this is very simplistic, I don't mean it this way, but I call it cookie cutter, trying to make it cookie cutter as possible. Um, because there are some financial advisors that really do, you know, make a lot of money out of these things. Um, yeah. And it needn't be that way. So it's a particular niche, but actually using the existing legislation, which thanks to the uh, EU uh, method regulations, you know, they are in the interests of the um, of the individual investors. You know, there's a lot of changes in the last number of years to actually try and protect them. So the, the motives are genuine. It's just, it's used by the big players to, to maximize return for, the, for, for themselves. The, um, you know, cooperative PLC earlier, is this the, the vehicle that your founders are proposing for co-op exchange? So it, it needs to be a cooperative POC um, in order to actually raise that, that money um, that we're talking about. Because we're talking, mm -hmm. I'll not uh, go into specifics just now, but we are talking about millions. Um, so yes, that's exactly what we're, we're, we're trying to practice what we preach and talking Would it go, about. Go, go on to an alternative investment market? Well, that's ourselves. That's the point. So co-op exchange is effectively the equivalent of AIM. It is. It will be effectively a regulated stock exchange, yes. um, just for Dave's benefit. Um, and actually, Elizabeth, you've not uh, heard this before, so apologies mm -hmm. for your benefit as well. Rory's heard me to death talking about this, so he knows it inside out. But um, the technology has been written already. Um, it's the uh, ironically, it's raising capital for a capital raising platform <laughs> that, yeah. that's been the been the delays and um, yeah. COVID and different things. So, and we focused on getting VME quote conversions. So, um, so it's a very niche area, but that's why I don't think it clashes with community shares. It's, it's no. a completely different area, you know. There's, there's, there's a fascinating case which you might be aware of, um, Rory especially, but you as well, Stephen and Elizabeth. But it's called Equal Care. Um, which oh, yeah. is, yeah. Uh, which, and they've, they've, yeah, they've, I've worked on their share issue. They've raised, you know, about half a million through withdrawable share I think, capital. I think I'm a member. I'm a member right. of the internationalist as well. There's right. one, is there another one called Social Care Co op, or was it always called Equal Care Co op? 
It's, I think it's always been called equal care. Yeah, I, I, I just um, in my own notes, I've probably right. used, given it the wrong name. Yeah. So, so they've realised that there is a market for institutional investors in into that uh, area, um, and the two things we've got to work out really is what's the way in which these investors get value from the activities of the co-op. It's all very well saying, "Oh, transferable shares will be better." Why? What, what actually gets it? Why, why is there going to be an appreciating capital market? And it has to be something to do with capturing some of the revenues of expanded growth of the activities. That, that's the linkage between, growth, between revenues from expanding growth and the holding of shares, which give rights to, the, to some of those um, funds. And there is a point at which you just realise that it doesn't work inside a community benefit society with withdrawable shares. You can have transferable shares, obviously, in a community benefit society as you can with a cooperative, but that then exposes you back to the whole problem of you've got to get a Section 21 sign-off in the UK, which is costing you £15,000. So if you can do the cookie-cutter kind of... I mean, you know, and it's, it's one of those rules which is observed as much in the breach um, in the sense of, you know, if you take a Cedars... Kind of approach to this or crowd cube the way they get around this section 21 problem is by make, saying that it's automatically restricted to sophisticated investors mm -hmm. and that means that when you sign up to use their site you self-certify as a sophisticated mm -hmm. investor and nearly every one of the things you see on crowd cube yes. uh, is, is this being recorded for all of this part yes it is yes Excellent. Okay, Crowdcube have some interesting investments on that, um, which uh, which have interesting valuations of the company as a whole on the basis of the proportion of equity which is being sold to the public. And I feel sure at some point the FCA's interest is going to zero in and yeah. they're going to find that the self-certification ruse is a ruse or, or class yeah. it as such. And it's going to create a problem there at that stage. But and there is something about the democratization of capital that, that mm -hmm. of course, people need protection from the snake oil sales people who can rob your granny of her life savings. But at the same time, there's something quite paternalistic about the kind of view. And, and it's actually disempowering to people to say you can't make decisions about what to do with some of your capital. Therefore, we, and, 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 and we're going to not allow you to do it. What about allowing people to do it up to a certain amount? You know, there are other ways you could write regulations to say an individual can have up to ten thousand pounds worth of investment in 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 uh, investments in the in a particular class of investment, which means that the ordinary investor is absolutely happy to get to go into that market without it needs to be over regulated. But the whole thing seems to be from the perspective of it's um, yeah, it's I, one I, of those. It, I come does, across it a lot. The, yeah. Um, I, I sort of I, re I recently got an inheritance so some of it's gone into government bonds some of it goes into the crowd fund crowdfunding world so I've got yeah and each of the crowdfunding platforms you have to say that you've done crowdfunding before or you're a sophisticated investor or you've got yeah. a certain amount of income so that's the same same thing yeah right? yeah and, it's, it's, and then it's, the other it's who, um, you know sort of socially responsible managed managed funds you know and, and yes things. but the yeah there's I, I always think there's something quite there's something quite honest and straightforward by about the crowdfunding platforms i mean they don't they don't fluctuate the way you know they count they, they, they completely ignore the stock market in terms of the returns that they give you yeah um, it's entirely depends on on what's happening with the investments that you have made and that's it Yes. No, it's not the secondary market pull of demand that's that's shaping what you get back. Yes. Um, I mean, I do think I do think the UK crowdfund equity crowdfunding um, is kind uh, of yeah, an exemplifier. It's, it's an exemplifier of everything wrong with British capitalism, because every yeah. single business on there is being basically the exit point for the big realization of any profit is when we sell to the bigger beast in the Amer in, mm. in America. And essentially, it, the, 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 the journey of the capital flow ends up in Silicon Valley. Hmm. And it's yeah. kind of, and, and that's kind of just baked into the model of how it's done in the UK. And that's... It's baked, you know, it's baked in, in a very specific way as well, isn't it? Yes, they, they, yes. I, I, there was a, an energy project that 
caught my eye. But when I investigated it, the founders of this NFV project have given themselves tens of thousands of shares at a tiny fraction of one penny. Yeah. So the guy got like, you know, for 10 pounds, I think he got a million shares or something. And of course, they're going to sell those shares to the wider public at a much, much higher price, which which means that they're inflating their own pockets by a thousand percent or more, I would have thought. Yeah, it's like cryptocurrency. It's like yeah. a, an ICO. But, the, but it strikes me that the the crowd lending platforms, this isn't equity finance, of course, the crowd lending platforms don't suffer from this. You know, you have to raise money from people and be honest about what they can expect by way of a, a, a return on their investment. How are we doing for time? So I better just tell them that um, they've got 10 minutes left. Uh, I, I um, think equity, equity sorry, debt-based fund platforms have a kind of honesty to them. It's like that scene in Goodfellas where he kind of says, now you've got Paulie as a business partner. Business is not good. Fuck you, pay me. Biz, you know, fire burn it down, fuck you, pay me. And that kind of notion that you have to actually pay these people back does keep you honest. And I actually work, when I work with groups, the best ones are the ones, you know, there are some groups who see community share capital as a bit like a grant, yes. but not quite, yes. in the sense of this, it's a donation being provided through that's, munificence from their community. That's, the that's best what ones, that's the best ones that are doing it because it's a cheaper than debt. They could happily do debt, but they'd rather do it more cheaply and recycle the money in their community rather than pay it to a, an external third party institution. And those are the best share offers because they've actually, and, and I didn't get to touch on this, there is a split within the community shares world. Um, and it's not a split of ideology or, or worldview, it's just the type of offer. You've got ownership offers, which are based on the pub in our community is closing, we must rally around to save it to run it as a community owned yeah. venture and the, the and the return as such from that end the, the the enjoyment of the asset is the use of the facility mm. and then you've got investment offers which are much we you know that as you were starting to see much more in housing community-led housing and, and picking up on the fact that energy's kind of got into a difficult place in the uk um and that, that that's where you, you're actually saying you know yes you can own this thing and it's dead good but Actually, it's also a reasonably solid investment proposition in an era of incredibly low interest rates. For me, so, though, there's a there's a moral question, which is, you know, is it ethical if you if you fund a venture that becomes more and more valuable, that you do not share the capital gains with the wider membership? I mean, the, the, the difference between what you've described. For, yeah, yeah. You know, the yeah. best share offers in the UK is very different. Yeah. In Mondragon, they're still paying, I think, six percent the last time. I went there. Yeah. So every year, the members who've left their capital invested, yeah, um, are getting six percent on that capital. Plus, um, uh, uh, on top of that, if, if there's a surplus generated, they're credited with a share of that surplus into the same account. So, yeah, yeah, um, and and of course, by the the time they, you know, the, the emphasis they put on was on life planning. You know, that uh, when it comes to retirement over there, they, many of them are able to pay off their mortgages using the the capital that's accumulated in their account at the point yes. of retirement and therefore they yes. can enjoy their retirement that much more that much more because their pension isn't you know their pension or their lump sums that come with pension don't go on paying off mortgages and stuff absolutely yeah um i mean that's what we're missing we don't you know it, there's a whole this, this, this I'm is what, sure you have this a, is what debate had about this yeah this is what was in my mind steve when um, i wrote that sentence about you know, you can mm. invest, but don't expect the return anytime soon. Um, it strikes me in other parts of the world that the, the thriving nature of the cooperative movement is because they found this balance between the immediate benefit to the producers and consumers who need to earn a living and the, the community benefit of having a share of the surplus, a limited share of the surplus uh, that funds that activity. And, and I mean, I'd be all in favour, actually, if... if um, an investment co-op it's made its money by lending money to people to buy equity in their own co-ops so you you actually fund worker members to buy their own stake in the way that they do at mondragon or they're, in, they're doing it in sheffield actually the um the the gripple group they they lend money to their new employees to buy their stake 
in the enterprise. Um, so that you're not, in a sense, it, it's debt finance, finan financing equity in finance, but the equity finance is the stuff that gives you the value over the long term, which you don't think about at the time that you get it, but yeah. years down the line will be incredibly valuable, you hope, of course, uh, if, unless, unless the business goes down the pan, of course. Mm. Um, so, uh, I mean, and, and one of the things which comes, which springs to mind again is the regulatory framework and the, the legislative framework. Mm. It's, it's the same old story of the cooperative movement is at the end of the queue when it comes to updating and revising that framework. Um, you know, it, it took Co-ops UK all of their efforts to get the 2014 Act, which was essentially a consolidation. There was, no, there was not a scintilla of, of a notion that this might be an interesting time to develop that framework yes. and yes. innovate using that framework to look at things like, should cooperative societies be able to have indivisible reserves, as is yes. common in, 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 in other European and global yes. cooperatives? This, yes. this weird split between cooperatives which have to do it this way, and you, know, you can't have indivisible reserves, you can't have entrenchment in UK cooperative societies like you can in companies and it's this constant privileging of the flexibility we ride on the coattails if you're using company structures of the fact that there are gazillions of professional advisors who lobby for for innovation mm. in the way these regulations are framed and and written and the cooperative movement is always oliver twist asking for a bit more gruel yeah um just conscious we probably need to give them a um should I give them a three-minute warning? Very quick question, but in that three minutes. So, Dave, we uh, had a meeting with Jim Brown. Yeah. Uh, first time I met him, I um, had a good meeting, myself, Pauline, Ben, and himself. Um, and when I discovered the book Cooperative Capital, I had to pay £60 for it or something online, but yeah. uh, I managed to get hold yeah. of the book. Um, and it was like a manifesto for what I was trying to propose. So, yeah, um, I mean, uh, 2004, his ideas were there. Although he did explain to us that um, a lot of some people had called him evil, you know, for even having these ideas. So, uh, but it's just Jim's been, uh, uh, you know, his writings have been fascinating to uh, uh, to read. And so it was, it was interesting you mentioned that he's been heavily involved in what you've been. Yeah, he's, he, he, he's stepping he's stepping away now. He's he's, he's mm. formally retired. Um, yeah. I mean, he'll, you know, he'll still be around, but it's, it is interesting in that he's been, he's driven it through the institutional, I wouldn't say barriers of Co-ops UK and locality, but these are intensely politicised organisations with a small P and therefore it's needed a relatively large personality like Jim which is to say somebody who will tell anybody who needs to fuck off to fuck off <laughs> um, that, that he will, he, you know, he's been able to sort of create that space for this to happen. And with him stepping away and there being a new chief exec at Co-ops UK and the, the people who are running Co-op, the community shares thing in Co-ops UK being on short term temporary contracts, it does sort of create a vacuum. So there's this committee which is overseeing that uh, cooperative capital co co yeah community and cooperative capital committee um and that's going to basically be the new jim brown and it's you know it's working okay in terms of it's a collaborative approach to thinking about what developments we can move it in but i do sometimes fear that without that kind of driving force of a personality things can sort of sink down into the sort you know revert to the mean as it were I'll be coming back into the room in a few seconds. So okay, I'm just going to get some water. Excuse me a second. Okay. Mute myself. Yeah, actually, we started with two smallish groups that grew and grew as people uh, joined us. So, room two included um, Adotabeing. I hope I pronounced that right. Gillian, Martin, Sylvia, and Timothy, and Darren. So that's your first group. So should we, yeah. So I guess as with the previous session, and I'm sure you had really uh, lively discussions and contributions. So if you would like to share with us um, what you've been discussing or some key questions that you would like to raise uh, for the uh, panelists to respond to.
Sil well, I, I can respond partly. Uh, Sylvia raised the very interesting issue around uh, creating a financial ecosystem for the development of co-ops. And uh, we discussed specifically that, for instance, I think in Canada, credit unions uh, have helped to fund work of co-ops. Um, but it doesn't seem to happen in the UK that there's any link between credit unions and cooperative development. And equally, Timothy mentioned that in Kenya, the SACOs could be created to allocating surpluses to investment in, for instance, worker cooperatives, but that's not happening either. So I guess this issue of a financial ecosystem, and in fact, seeing it as a, a cooperative movement rather than kind of cooperative silos is quite an important one to address. Anyone from the same group that would like to add to Martin's uh, observations? Uh, just maybe to uh, expand much more on the question I had raised, uh, which you were just discussing before we could uh, come back to the main session, is that uh, in the Global South, the way I'm joining in, uh, and look at the East African region, I'm almost credit union, largely referred to as circles. Um, they prefer, uh, most of them, they are, they are reinvesting much more in the real estate sector. Uh, none of these uh, cooperatives actually uh, prefer uh, investing their surpluses uh, in shares, uh, like the worker cooperatives uh, here. In, we've had uh, a few development partners who are currently championing for the workers' cooperative model. And we have uh, a few young people who are actually uh, undertaking and piloting various worker cooperatives and um, uh, uh, in Kenya, for instance. But um, uh, what uh, we as the, uh, as the policy advocates and the researchers uh, in the uh, 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 social enterprises sector, we've been asking ourselves the big question, um, what could be the issue that uh, most of these uh, big cooperatives uh, with billions of shillings, uh, uh, which uh, most time uh, uh, cause unused and then it is embezzled by the uh, uh, governing uh, leaders, that um, uh, how might we maybe give them you know, a solution, uh, a different solution from just the real estate uh, industry so that then they maybe have a place to uh, 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 invest uh, their surpluses, which uh, tends to co uh, to waste. Uh, most of these uh, uh, cooperatives, they splash the surpluses in the form of um, uh, CSR. Uh, that is a community, um, uh, service responsibility, and they just do that so that they can actually have an opportunity to uh, use this surplus for their own personal gains. So we're asking ourselves that uh, what uh, might we do in the global south to provide this particular solution? Uh, a solution in the pillar in terms of one, safeguarding the members' resources or rather investments, and also uh, help them, you know, uh, create even more earnings for the members. That's great, Timothy. Uh, I wasn't in the group, but I just want to say that sounds very like something I observed in Indonesia. There was uh, a, a regional centre, Yogyakarta, where there was exceptionally good co-op development around the development of successful credit unions. Um, on the issue of uh, reinvesting, the Mondragon co-ops, there's a fixed percentage in law that must go to social and educational projects. And I know that this doesn't happen in the UK. I think when Ian Adderley investigated the history, there was objection even to the 2.5% that became the norm for member education in the UK, whereas in Mondragon it's 10%. So, you know, 10% of surplus is going into social and educational projects. You, you don't, that's the, that, that replaces CSR. CSR is, is usually down at the level of around 1%, at least in the UK it is. Um, so it's a, it's a massive investment in, in, in community development and they create, you know, cooperative foundations and cooperative associations that then manage and place that money into the schools networks, into the health system, 
even helping out um, high risk investment projects as well. Okay, Could I just perhaps add a little something, which is that um, um, I spent a couple of two years ago, I was in the, uh, in the US uh, researching, doing some research on cooperatives in Mississippi. And um, one of the things that um, became very clear was that uh, uh, whereas America has a very large number of uh, cooperatives of different kinds, I believe they have more than 30,000, um, the United States government is loath to um, suggest to people uh, the, the, the movement of cooperatives into they're happy to do sort of procurement and marketing and um, supplier cooperatives and so on, even consumer cooperatives. But, uh, but they find worker cooperatives a total anathema. And it seems to me that <clears throat> that, um, that mindset is what, is, is what goes along with cooperative uh, building um, around the world when it's being done and financed by uh, groups from within the US or Canada or indeed parts of Europe. And I think that to break that, you know, that's important to try to break that in order to be able to see uh, cooperative development moving into 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 that area. Um, if I can just take, <clears throat> I won't take long, just just a minute. I think it should take me just about a minute. But I'm working with some other people. I'm from Ghana. I'm working with some people in Ghana, and we're actually trying to set up what we're calling a public company limited by guarantee, which is an organization that will um, promote cooperative sort of enterprise, put it shortcut way across the continent and within Ghana especially. Um, and that the idea is to, to do so by establishing, you know, where we can, um, cooperative financing organizations, i.e. Uh, banks that will, small banks that will support cooperative formation and development. And I think that, so we're starting at the other end, as it were, trying to tackle the issue from the point of view of the, you know, the, the, the difficulty accessing capital. But now you're having capital that is act consciously going to try and, and support cooperatives. But the people behind it are also kind of committed to the development of cooperative education and development of worker cooperatives as well along, along the way. Should I tell you group two was... Dennis, uh, Hal, Grant, Raphael, Roger, Trey, and Wu. So, who would there? So, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words initially, and then uh, um, everyone can uh, jump in. Um, yeah, I mean, um, Grant, Grant didn't have a microphone. And um, uh, Dong, Dong arrived later on. Um, Raf, we, we did an intro. I, I hadn't realized Raphael is now in, in uh, Montreal, which I, um, Quebec, I regard Quebec as, you know, like a nirvana of, of um, invention about social finance. Um, and he raised the, uh, the interesting question about um, what about what about the state? Uh, you know, and if we if you look at social finance in the UK uh, with big society capital, for example, that that was a combination of um, well, state um, state taking uh, dormant, dormant bank accounts and reallocating them and twisting the arms of banks to create a, <clears throat> a wholesale fund. And I don't know whether they 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 lend that wholesale money to any co cooperative uh, funding institutions. But I think the state uh, has played an important role in social finance, in, in certainly in the UK. Um, Bridges Ventures is another, another case. Um, Trey, Trey uh, also raised the, the issue, um, as did Dennis, about um, this big room that Dave mentioned that cooperators are in, not realizing you know, the fullest extent of the room and what it means to be uh, in a cooperative. Um, I think Trey was using the, the concept of concepts from complexity theory to, um, I think, express the idea that adaptive learning 
might take place, but she can correct me on that. Um, and um, we we did we had some discussion about how raising finance can be can be done in, in quite an educational manner. Um, um, I mentioned my experience with with bus drivers trying to buy their own municipal bus company, uh, interrogating corporate tax lawyers and accountants. Um, <clears throat> and um, you know, I probably missed several other things, but uh, that, that was the main uh, points. Ra Raphael or Trey, do you want to, to add anything or, or correct me? No, great summary. Thanks, Roger. <laughs> Um, I'm I'm willing to throw a few things in. Thank you, Roger. That was that was you actually did great. We we talked about so many different topics, and I think you touched on every single one of them. Um, so thank you for that. My deep appreciation to you. Um, so there were a couple of things that that I just sort of threw into the pot, not quite sure where they would go. Um, the first one is just this whole idea of cooperation you know we use cooperation like we use collaboration and I, and sometimes i wonder if we even know what we're talking about or what the values are that we're codifying or what those values look like in action and and one of the questions that i have that i'm just going to throw out as a general question to the speakers is this idea of healthy agency and that we're often very much assuming healthy agency and that people have an experience of that in order to be able to even play in the sandbox. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, there are a couple of links and I, I shared them in the breakout, but I'm not sure if they translated back here. If they didn't, then what I'll do is I'll put them back in. Um, but there's two very strong, uh, very current things that literally just came out last month. Um, the first one is uh, in the UK, a, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Toby Lowe, who is out of Northumbria University and has now been seconded to the Center for Public Impact. Um, they came out with their third report, which actually wound up not being a report. There were so many case studies, they wound up turning it into an ebook, and the ebook is free for anybody who wants to grab hold of it. And um, it's around commissioning in the public sector and how money is now shifting and the, and the new, ma what they're calling new management inside of the public sector. And the whole idea of instead of funding projects and programs and this whole idea of we can actually predict outcomes, which is a little bit absurd when you consider the complexity of what's going on. And this is where Roger I touched on Dave Snowden's idea of complexity and what we mean by that. Um, they've coined the term human learning systems. In other words, humans learning, or let's even define it for humans discovering and systematizing humans discovering. And that that's actually where the funding needs to go because then it doesn't matter if it's climate change or if it's, or, or, or if it's, cleaning the oceans or whatever it is, if we can systematize humans learning and funding that. And there's very groundbreaking funding that has come out of the UK by the Lang Kelly Chase Foundation, L-A-N-K-E-L-L-Y, Lang Kelly Chase. Um, and they have literally put forward 80 million pounds over 10 years where it's completely based in relationship. They don't know what the outcomes are. And it's literally about three months stints of going into the deep end, gaining the data, having the data lead the next three months, and then having the data lead the next three months and having the data lead the next three months so that it can be responsive to complexity over the next 10 years. I believe, and I just threw it out as a thought and I wanna throw it out to the speakers that inside of what we're talking about, which is this idea of cooperatives and cooperativism and what it means to cooperate, that there is a really juicy opportunity here to blend history with what is emerging and, and, and to have some coexisting happening. And so I wanna sort of throw out that as a thought. Final thought was um, there was an event that happened last month 
again, I'll put the link into the chat. <clears throat> and it was around regenerative platforms. Um, instead of platforms being extractive and transactional, which we tend to sort of get into this transactional language when we talk about cooperatives, producers, consumers, et cetera, et cetera, that when we start moving into ideas of stewardship and regeneration, um, the kinds of things that are being discussed now and the kinds of things that things are happening and all of the videos, all 12 hours of videos from the event that happened in June are on the site, they are free for anyone to see and anyone to look at as well as the data that we gathered from the participants who, who engaged in the event that, that uh, snippets of that information is available there as well. And so just, just throwing that out to the group and, and with that, um, I'm complete. Thank you for your time. And I'd like yeah, to add right? one small question. Sorry, I forgot that before. And that is to um, um, Mr. Adoti Bing Papoy, if I um, pronounce properly the name, who was speaking before from the other group, because he mentioned that he has experience with uh, Mississippi, if I understood properly. And so I was just, I once heard a really fascinating um, um, podcast on worker cooperatives in Mississippi. And what was fascinating about it is that they said the only way to have real change is to make it a political project via a party and so I, I'm just wondering if you can say is, is this still alive is it still going on this kind of um, um, directly political but at least this gentleman was presenting that way and the second question for you is if you can share a link to your um, Ghana project for this um, bank that would also be very interesting okay um, so um, with relation to Mississippi uh, to say first of all that the cooperative movement in Mississippi was actually the political wing of the um, civil rights movement, which and a lot of people know about the political wing of the civil rights movement, but not about the economic wing of the civil rights movement, which is what the cooperative movement in Mississippi was. So that's the, that's the first thing to say. Yes, the, the, the most um, significant um, legacy of that process is something called the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, um, uh, which exists, which is based in, 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 in um, different states or different towns in, 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 in Mississippi State. And that still exists and that has been able to preserve um, the land holding held by African-Americans, um, which they had soon after 1865 um, and continue to hold that land into the present time. It, it has been reduced but it's still significant. So I think there's over 2.3 million uh, hectares of land that are still held by African-Americans as a result of the activity of um, that cooperative movement. Um, so yeah, so those are, those are, some, those are some of the things. Um, I kind of spoke prematurely about, we're about to create this organization. We're about to register, we're about to apply for registration. And um, hopefully in the next uh, six to eight weeks, we will have that done. Um, we have a website that is being built. So when we are in that position, I will be able to share. I'll be more than willing to be able to share. I'll be happy to share um, um, the, the the website and 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 what with what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, I'm a member of um, uh, this organization, so that would be I will I will send it to here as one of the first places that I will send it to to try to get the word to spread, knowledge to spread about it. Thank you. Oh, that's great and thank you all for sharing all these uh, resources and please uh, add them to, to the chat for the benefit of everyone. So uh, I think we have uh, 15 minutes left for our speakers to come back. There were several ideas and um, uh, topics raised like uh, the issue of uh, financial ecosystems, the global south and how to reinvest surpluses the role of state in social finance, um, the idea and the meaning of cooperation, cooperativism, the assumption of healthy agency, uh, and so many and more things. So if the uh, panelists would like to come back and choose you know, what they would like to uh, comment on, that, that would be great. And if you have any last questions, please uh, put them in the chat or comments, please do. Like me to go first, Dave? Yeah, so yeah, go for it, Stephen. Please do. Sure, sure, sure. Well, there's no way I'm going to take 
15 or even seven minutes, but uh, I, I just want to pick up on a couple of points there, some superb points, and I'm not going to be able to cover them all. Um, but it's interesting um, because, Timothy, you, you, you raised quite some really, really interesting points there. Um, and, and I don't think it just applies uh, to Kenya. I think it applies across the world. Is, is what is the surplus used for? Um, and and it's I, I love the fact you're talking about partners championing for the worker co-op model. Um, I mean, it's so important. I at the moment I'm studying for a, a master's in cooperative management at St Mary's University, and I'm learning an awful lot about the cooperative economy. And and it fascinates me that we have what 3.2 trillion of turnover through the whole cooperative sector. Um, I, I can't quote figures on how much is actually reinvested into growing the cooperative economy. Um, you know, that, that sector seems large, but if you look at the, the wider sector of the whole world, you know, we should be, for example, principle six. You know, we should be, we should be supporting smaller cooperatives to grow, they, otherwise how do they grow? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of angles in there. But one thing I thought was particularly interesting is that the, the concept that I'm describing um, either through what I'm talking about, Cope Exchange, or, or other concepts, um, is the idea of maybe collective investments, for example. So the idea of maybe cooperative uh, mutual pension funds coming together, investing in smaller societies, and then spreading the risk of that investment, because there's always a risk in, in new ventures, regardless of, of how large or small that, that risk may be, but spreading that um, so that they're members um, could choose to support the cooperative economy, but also potentially, and this is the controversial part of it, but also potentially uh, grow their capital in doing so. So that would be an interesting angle for, for the point that Timothy made, that uh, it would be an asset on the balance sheet of those larger societies to actually, uh, you know, not something you could really mix up, um, but it would be supporting the cooperative economy. So. Um, so I think that that's really kind of the key point. I think one of the things that Roger also mentioned, um, I know that Dave mentioned at first, is the big room. I do think as a movement, that's something that that we need to um, we need to address. It leads on to my principle six point, but it's also principle five education, um, making people aware of the value of actual um, of democracy um, and autonomy. Because we mentioned state involvement there, and I think you know one of the key principles of cooperatives is, is that autonomy. Uh, they should be able to um, a, to find their own their own destiny and move forward. So, um, so yeah, I think we've got work that, that's required on that. Funding obviously will help with that. Um, Trace points were superb, but I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I think I'll connect with you uh, separately, Trey, because I think there's some fantastic. Um, information there. I think you've added an awful lot to it. I'm going to go and download the ebook and read through that. But one, just one small word that you used that was fantastic, which is stewardship. And, and I do see that. That that's one of the my personal beliefs is that, you know, we are stewards of um, cooperatives for the next generation. Um, and I do think that should be built in in some shape or form, um, a, even including things like indivisible reserves and so forth. Um, and as Anna has just mentioned, there, Graham Boyd. I've worked with Graham. Uh, and Rory for a few years now, and uh, Graham absolutely uh, uses that to the to, to a big extent. So, um, and I think that's it. I think I'm going to stop at that point. So, if anyone wants to reach out, I'll put my contact details in the in the chat. So, thank you. Thank you. That's great, uh, Dave. Um, yeah, I, I feel uh, something of a disadvantage because I simply don't know enough to comment in any meaningful or judicious way on much of what was said. Um, and I think in general, white people in the UK should not speak of things they know not of um, when there are people in the room who are more able to do that. So the only the only one thing I would say is just to take a pick up on that point of, um, I think from a UK perspective, and again, I'm sick of the UK perspective and I get kind of a little bit sick of the UK being seen as some paragon of cooperation mm -hmm. um, when it seems to me that everywhere in the world does it a lot better. And, and as we see with football, um, you know, just because you got there first doesn't mean you're actually good at it and other people can iterate more successfully. Um, but I do think there is something about the slightly brittle way in which the cooperative movement views its history in the UK, um, which is fundamentally a history of 
glorious success and victory and then astonishing failure over the last 50 years. And because it doesn't like to speak of those times, um, I think it kind of hides its light under a bushel. And what we're creating in some respects with, through the community shares movement is lots of small little cooperatives. I've just got a funny memory. This has happened some point in the past and then it all went a bit tits up. So I, I, I do wish there was more um, honest exposition and disinterring of what quite went wrong with British consumer cooperatism. Um, and actually to speak of that as a failure and not as a glorious retreat into another staging ground before we launch the next kind of um, the next uh, iteration into, into the field. There is this kind of movement language which is unhelpful um, at this particular point. So, so I do think it would be really good if, if we could learn the lessons, you know, even things like, you know, that what happens when members want dividends over reinvestment um, and prioritise electing boards of directors who prioritise servicing that appetite, leaving the societies denuded of capital to reinvest, to, check, to respond to changing markets. Getting and, and, and understanding the relationship between what happened with the decline of education and, and, and education in cooperatives, which I know, Rory, you've touched on in terms of the dif disparity, I think, in our chat about the disparity between what was considered normal in the UK and, and somewhat begrudgingly and what was normal in Mondragon and kind of, you know, just how did all of this happen? I'd love to know so we don't make the same mistakes again. Dave out. <laughs> On a positive note, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so should we, uh, we, we, we can, we can call it a day then? Call it a day or yeah. any, you know, you can stay for the next five minutes. I don't know if you want I'm to. I'm not going to close the room immediately if anybody wants to stay behind for, for five minutes. Um, I'd like to thank again our, our speakers for their insightful contributions. I've personally have learned a lot today and have some, you know, read resources to go back to and uh, <laughs> educate myself. I hope you find it um, as interesting. Yeah, so I'll, I'll echo that. Um, just to let you know, it, it, it takes a little while to process the videos. Um, we do edit them uh, just for, to sort of take out the sort of housekeeping comments so that the videos that we post up online are, are fully about the content of the of the seminar rather than the idle chat that takes place from time to time. Um, if you were in a breakout room and you want to know what the facilitators and panelists were talking about, that will be in the video. So um, you can see what the what we were talking about. We have to rely on your reports back, but you can see ours verbatim. Um, I will add um, subtitles later on, but we get the videos out first and then when the transcripts are done, uh, we'll add the transcripts as subtitles to the videos. Okay, so thank you everybody for your contribution. Uh, just to let you, the next one will be in September. So if you registered your interest in seminar three, um, it's actually going to take place over two half days. Um, uh, so I forget the precise dates. Um, uh, but the reason for that is Marcelo Vieta, who introduced the first seminar, you know, who's, who's the, probably the leading authority on new cooperativism in, in the world. Um, he's involved as a facilitator for both of those events. And that means that we have to start at 3, 3.30 in the afternoon, basically, so that uh, he can be here. Uh, that's it. I think that's still about eight o'clock in the morning for him. So, <laughs> all right. So thanks, everyone. Um, uh, have it's not quite the weekend but I hope you're not too disappointed about the football if you were following that um, and, or you were thrilled with the results if you if you I was <laughs> <laughs> Italian heritage and I hope we'll see many of you again in September all right cheers thank you bye bye, cheers. bye. thank you thanks yeah. and let me stop recording yeah thank you